Welcome everyone to the March meeting of the CentOS Board of Directors. Um, we did not have an official meeting last week because the announcement didn't go out um, because we, most of us were traveling back from FOSDOM. So we just casually met, didn't take meeting notes and we did not publish it as the fact that it was totally um, low key and unofficial. Um, the meeting minutes that are posted here on the agenda as the previous minutes are January, as that was our last official meeting. Um, Christian, you are actually up first if you'd like to go. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, can you hear me all right? Yes. Awesome. All right, I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen. Just give me one second. All right, if you have any issues, Davida is the host. He has the commands. Yeah, and thanks, Davida, for uh, helping us out here from the airport. I'll do my best. Uh, you should have permissions to share and do what you're supposed to do for what it's worth. Or at least I don't see anything here that's blocking that. Okay, lo lots of Wayland uh, and GNOME modals. Can you see something? Yep. We see your screen. You are good to go. All right. You you you're, you see these slides, right? Yes. All right. Then I'm just going to very quickly recap um, what I presented with Alessandro at CentOS Connect um, at FOSDEM. Um, just kind of uh, for uh, for those of you who don't know, um, well, first of all, let me introduce myself. Um, I'm Christian Glombeck. I am... An engineer in the OpenShift arc, and I've been working um, on on OpenShift and OKD for a couple of years now. OKD is the community variant, um, the community distribution of OpenShift, um, as you may know. And so far, it's been running on uh, Fedora Core OS, and we have now introduced a new operating system, a new flavor of the Core OS um, family of ecos uh, of, of operating systems, CentOS Dream Core OS. So. Uh, with that um, effort, we have joined the CentOS Cloud SIG um, to make sure we'll, we follow all the proper processes and actually feed into the, the uh, CentOS funnel uh, of collaboration uh, with, with this project. Um, so really, yeah, what is OKD? OKD is the community distribution of Kubernetes uh, that powers Red Hat OpenShift, uh, the product. It's the OpenShift code base running on top of CoreOS. And CoreOS can be, in the product, it's RHEL CoreOS. And in OKD, it can be either one of the uh, flavors, Fedora CoreOS or CentOS Dream CoreOS. Um, and we have two official streams, uh, release streams, um, which are these two. But with the OKD uh, streams effort, we actually uh, provide the capability to uh, essentially do your own builds and mix and match uh, the the contents of the operating system because we actually run the operating system compose the rpm os tree compose um, so the way this looks uh in the the core os ecosystem and uh, how centos stream core os uh, aka scos uh, fits in there um the development and everything happens upstream in fedora core os and uh, that system that operating system is maintained by the Fedora Core OS uh, working group in, in Fedora land, essentially. Um, and that has been feeding, uh, and that is already essentially the, the manifest making up um, RHEL Core OS on the other side um, are already, the, the Fedora Core OS manifests are included uh, and extended by RHEL Core OS. And CentOS Stream uh, now fits in the middle. We, we essentially rebuild or we build uh, the same manifest that RHEL Core OS builds. Um, but we use CentOS RPM, CentOS Stream RPMs um, for, for most RPMs. Currently, we still uh, source some of our RPMs from, uh, you might say, dubious sources like Copper, um, where we have essentially CI builds uh, that, that we consume. We want to um, pull, uh, pull that up into the uh, Cloud SIG and really um, internally within, within the OpenShift org, uh, do more of the builds uh, through the uh, through the cloud SIG on the CBS build system, so we essentially can provide uh, official SIG builds of uh, components like Cryo, 
uh, OpenShift uh, clients and OpenShift HyperShift, which is the kubelet in, in OpenShift or OKD's case. Um, so, and, and there's kind of essentially just a couple of RPMs missing, just a handful that's, I think, six or seven RPMs uh, we'll have to essentially pull into, into the cloud sig and release through, through that channel in order to, to get rid of our copper builds there. Um, so this is the ecosystem. I don't know how much further I should go into the technicalities of, of RPM OS tree here in, in this forum, uh, which is what, what this presentation, um, what, what's in this presentation, the rest of the slides. So uh, really, as a, as a summary, I, I think I'm going to stop here. Uh, CentOS Stream Core OS is um, an intermediate step between Fedora Core OS and RHEL Core OS. So I think with uh, OKD Streams, we really have an equivalent to CentOS Stream. Um, so we, we really want to replicate that that model of, of development because um, I think it's gaining traction now and I see, I just, I think it's a logical thing to have this funnel, uh, the stream, um, and then in, in, in this case, uh, CentOS Stream Core OS, um, do the development there and then uh, kind of decide what to pull down into our cost, the product. Um, another thing that is uh, really cool and new in, in OKD and OpenShift is that the operating system is now delivered as a bootable container image. So it's a container image that um, RPM OS tree knows how to essentially write to disk and boot into. Um, so a, a delivery mechanism um, for the operating system. The bootable container image, once it's booted, it's not running as a container image, it's a real OS. Um, and uh, another uh, very important thing, OKD on SCOS includes CentOS Stream Core OS, the, the base operating system, which again, we produce bootable ISOs, but we also have this bootable container image. And um, that is available as a standalone artifact. So long term, we are hoping um, other people are picking, picking that up for their own projects. It's easily derivable and customizable, um, which I think, uh, and generally, it's, it's a really uh, cool technology, I, I think. Um, there, there's a lot of opportunity there. So uh, really, we, we want to show with OKD how you can uh, really use SCOS. We will be the primary consumer, but uh, we definitely want to enable other use cases outside of the OpenShift or Kubernetes use case um, for the SCOS-based operating system. Um, and yeah, with that, uh, I think that about covers what I wanted to talk about. If there's any questions, um, I think now's a good time. So was everyone, uh, just for my edification, I'm Diane Mueller. I work up with the OKD um, community um, and have been doing that for a long time um, and love that Christian is taking this on. Um, is any, was anyone not aware on this call of the, the effort around CentOS Streams core OS? Was, or is this is not hopefully anyone's first time hearing about it. I, I think uh, the work that, and the groundwork that was laid at, at CentOS Connect um, was really um, very good and, and hopefully we can move forward on the infrastructure to get a bootable image of this um, available through your infrastructure and that's sort of the goal that that I had just to build some awareness here um, amongst everybody officially. We've been doing a lot of stuff behind the scenes um, and so hopefully this this helps get it on everybody's radar and I know I, I see Neil there uh, as well. He's been in the um, the OKD working group for a long time too so there's a, num a number of folks here. So we just really wanted to make sure that it was on your roadmap um, and, and not a surprise to anyone. Christian, has he, have you followed up with Fabian since your conversations with him at POSDOM? Yeah, we, we met with Fabian and we kind of agreed that uh, once we get everything into place, uh, we will get back to him. So I, I think uh, we know what the next steps are. We just kind of have to, uh, to do these things. So that there's <clears throat> essentially two things we want to do. We want to do the RPM builds uh, on one hand, and then we also, um, we, are, we are working with the Massachusetts Open Cloud, which is um, an initiative from uh, a couple of universities and, and uh, projects, and they are going to provide us with uh, infrastructure. So we want to set up a cluster on their infrastructure, which is essentially right now we're, we're working on getting the, the OKD installer uh, working on their infrastructure once that 
that's done, we can do that. Uh, we'll, we'll be given a free cluster to use there. And we want to onboard that to the CentOS build infrastructure to make it an official part of the CentOS build infra. So we can then produce um, or run our, uh, our build pipelines for uh, CentOS Stream Core OS there. And uh, by that way, uh, or yeah, thereby then uh, uh, call them official CentOS artifacts. Um, so yeah, essentially we want to create a cluster we can uh, run these builds on and then make that cluster an, uh, a part of the official CentOS build infra, uh, which will also be usable, by the way, uh, by other SIGs um, and uh, also our OKD working group. But um, that, since it's a yeah, kind of an educational uh, thing with the uh, Massachusetts Open Cloud um, uh, that is supposed to be open to uh, yeah, to their students and we definitely want to kind of uh, do that, maintain that cluster collaboratively. Um, right now we're on the operate first dot cloud cluster, which is also hosted on the Massachusetts Open Cloud infrastructure. And um, we've kind of learned a lot about um, open operations and uh, sharing operations of, uh, in, the, in this case, Kubernetes resources uh, with the community and kind of maintaining and administrating that together with, with our community folks. So um, we want to take that model onto that uh, new CentOS build farm, essentially. Okay. And my only suggestion would be to make sure you're documenting this process to include in the new um, Cloud Sig Docs area in case anyone else wants to do something similar in the future. What architectures are you going to be targeting eventually for this? Uh, so right now we're um, just doing x86 builds, but we want to find a way to onboard ARM, um, ARM64 workers to, to our cluster. We, for, we, we have to set up the cluster first and they don't have ARM64 uh, nodes there. So we'll, we haven't uh, yeah, really thought about the details how to do that, but um, there is a way to kind of uh, add external nodes um, to, to clusters and we want to do that and then do multi-arch builds. And multi-arch in this case uh, will be uh, x86 and ARM64 or ARCH64. Uh, I'd be interested in PowerPC Little Indian, but I have my own objectives with that. <laughs> and we could certainly help the community if there's need for access to that because we have a cluster here on that as well. That would be amazing. Yeah, if, if we could uh, kind of sync up on um, on that, that would uh, definitely be awesome if we could uh, use some of the uh, the other Arch uh, compute that you have available, definitely. Sure thing. Lance, are you, Lance, are you at the um, uh, OSU still? Are you at yep. Oregon? Yeah. Yep. I'm still at Oregon State. Yeah, if you go to osuosl.org, you'll find our a uh, forum for access to that. We've met, we've met before ages ago at probably some OSCON thing. So yeah, perfect. Yeah. Lance, you said ARM, right? Uh, I was actually talking about PowerPC, but we also have ARM64. Yeah. It would be great to get other eyeballs on testing this too. So um, that's one thing we're trying to expand the, um, the testing of these different, because now we have, not only do we have SCOS and Fedora Core OS, but we have, um, OpenShift next, so with the two SCOS releases each with each release cycle. So we've got a lot of testing on our hands. So um, more folks helping is really wonderful. I actually have somebody working on using the Red Hat distribution of OpenShift for some Open Power Hub stuff that we've been doing. So it'd be nice if we didn't have to rely on that long term. So certainly once we get our stuff going, we could take a look at that some more once we get that going. That's great. So, uh, Christian, uh, um, you, you mentioned that there was a little bit of, of shared administration going on between, is that between, uh, you know, the cloud sig itself and Mass Open Cloud, or how do, how do you, uh, how are you sharing the, the actual operations of the clusters that you're working on? So, right now, we're kind of working on enabling their, their platforms. They have, they, they've been given 2,000 servers, somebody donated them uh, to them. And um, they set up uh, an API on top of it, which is essentially based off of OpenStack, uh, but it does manage the uh, 
the bare metal service they have. So for, for um, dynamically provisioning them. And we are kind of onboarding um, to that platform right now. And we, we've just been given access to a couple of nodes right now, essentially. Um, so that is at a very early stage uh, with the operate first uh, cloud where we're currently uh, running our workloads, our builds. Um, that is a project run by the uh, office of the CTO uh, of Red Hat and uh, kind of it's in the operate first uh, on GitHub, operate first uh, organization and the apps folder is essentially their uh, GitOps uh, folder where Argo CD essentially runs and applies all the resources uh, to the multiple clusters they actually manage with that repository. And that's how we kind of hook into operate first through um, that repository. And we're, we want to kind of continue that, um, just that paradigm of, of GitOps and GitOps first everything and then do um, manage the infrastructure through Git essentially. Yeah, that's very cool. Thank you. All right, do we have any more questions for Christian? Definitely sounds like we have a lot of people doing similar building. Maybe we should get everyone together for a birds of the feather next time we all meet up. To be some good conversations there. I definitely want to include the the Podman and Cryo and the the container containers organization on GitHub. Um, those folks, uh, because they have been kind of not building uh, their RPMs for CentOS, and I think this is a good opportunity to get all of them together and um, kind of do the RPMs build uh, through the cloud SIG um, and get yeah get get our container stack uh, in into CentOS essentially as a first class or as a SIG citizen, let's, let's say. All right, the next item on the agenda was the x86 SIG, but I don't see Fabian on. I really don't want us to have it. I mean, we can have a discussion, but I'd like them to participate in it. Um, it looks from reading through the thread that people are about 50-50 on whether it should join another SIG or be its own individual thing. So if you haven't read that thread, um, it was started on February 27th with the title proposal Cento SFX86 SIG. So just keep an eye out on that. And let's go ahead and bump this to next meeting and invite Fabian to come and present to us. He uh, Amy, uh, before we move on real quick, I guess, uh -huh. um, I guess I wanted to just ask the question, is anybody opposed to the work that they're proposing being done? Like it, it seems pretty interesting to me at the technical level. And I, I, uh, I think it'd be worthwhile to do that kind of investigation where and under which SIG certainly we can discuss later, but yeah, I think I that's more of the discussion. I don't think anyone's against what they want to do. Um, there was a little concern at one point, if I remember that, whether the infrastructure could do it, but I think someone answered that we could do it. Yeah. So it's really just where do they belong, I think. Yeah, I kind of echo Neil's comments there. Um, I. I love the idea of turning on more CPU flags and more optimization. That makes me extra super happy. But I'm wondering if that's the kind of experimentation that maybe Fedora is for. Um, no, so it's a, it's a very good question. And I actually talked to Florian about it um, individually uh, on an email thread. So some of what that SIG is looking at will happen in Fedora. Um, the challenge that we have is the baselines between Fedora and CentOS Stream 9 today are not equivalent. And so any performance comparison you do, you're, you're, you're like leaping two generations of performance as opposed to just comparing it to what, what CentOS Stream 9 and RHEL 9 have. So they were looking at it from a CentOS Stream perspective because they have a better baseline to compare against. Um, they have a known package set to iterate on as opposed to all of Fedora. Uh, and so really this is just like a constraint um, ELN does not have the EL, uh, 
EL9 build flags. Um, we didn't we didn't actually go through with the baseline change during the ELN time frame for for uh, CentOS Stream and RHEL 9, but we're correcting that for uh, future versions. So um, it's not that they're not going to do a lot of this in Fedora. It's that they're really looking for a place to have a very good baseline to compare things against and then use that data uh, to, to go make the changes in ELN as they go, if that makes sense. Brian, uh, Stenson, I know you and I had had both talked to Florian about this. Did I capture that accurately? Yeah, yeah, that's that's basically how I understand things. And doing the comparison within a like a, a major version is is exactly the activity that they're looking for. And so, um, I think the the outputs of this SIG, like the the data that they gather, is going to influence things in Fedora and the decisions that they make for uh, you know other uh, other flags and stuff like that. But looking at it within a major version, it's a lot easier to compare against uh, itself. Yeah. So that's uh, that's how I read things. So it sounds like you see these more as a research effort, shall we say, that would inform future work within CentOS Stream. Uh, my original understanding of this, and maybe I misread this, was that one of the goals was to deliver alternate sets of packages with specific optimizations. Yes. Is, am I reading this right? Is the idea to deliver packages with specific optimizations as well, or is the idea to use this just as data to inform the future baselines? Uh, a a uh, little bit of both. Yeah, um, a cool. little bit of both. Okay, so if, if one of the goals is also to deliver alternate sets of packages, I think there's probably some opportunities for collaboration here with some folks in hyperscale on the Intel side who are working on optimizations for packages like Zlib, uh, specifically for x86 CPUs. So there's probably opportunities there to join forces. Uh, so one thing I would personally like to see is what is the what is going to be the story for community contributions to this SIG uh, and for folks that aren't, that aren't working at Red Hat essentially to be able to contribute and help out and work there. Yeah, I, I certainly don't want to put words in Florian's mouth, um, but I believe the intention here is to open contributions to uh, vendors like Intel or AMD or any other uh, interested parties for x86, right? Um, but we can go back and ask him to make that clear in the, the SIG proposal. Oh. Do you foresee these expanding to other architectures in the future? Um, I think I would like to see something like this, whether it's Florian driving it, uh, I don't know. Um, but for now, I think keeping a smaller scope is probably better because as I said on the mailing list, like we have a tendency to go big and grand uh, and then we get lost along the way sometimes. And I, I want I, I like the nature of having a small scoped targeted effort here. Yeah, that's fair. It, it is clear that it can be achieved with a limited target. The the bigger the target, the harder it is to hit every edge of it. Um, I, I will say for the other side of the why it makes sense in CentOS instead of Fedora is that Fedora has to support all of your weird old laptops. And uh, the, the RHEL product just says, look, we're x86, 64 V2, comma, that's the way life is. Yeah. And that's not a case that is made in Fedora. And so there are some things that can be turned on within the EL space that would be impossible for the broader architecture support. No, and it does seem like from this discussion that they will be doing work upstream in Fedora, and then it will come to us, and they will do finalization testing and comparisons to get what they're looking for out of this. Um, so I think it is a good endeavor. Um, but I think we do need Fabian to answer some questions before we can move forward on this. Florian, not Fabian. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm in an F mood. Yeah. I got it right earlier. And then I was thinking Fabian because of infra. All right. It's okay. So do we have anything else on this? Okay. Um, I'm glad you're still here, Davida. So at the last meeting, actually, this came out of Bosdom at the Connect. The sign testing repositories, um, which is board issue number 92, which you can get on 
the agenda, which I meant to post in the chat. So let me add it there for anyone who wants to follow along. Um, we, we left it as it was a good idea, but we wanted to get agreement. Um, and no other comments have been added yeah, the, to that issue since oh, then. To elaborate the context there from, I talked to Dan out of band, uh, what he was looking for was if the packages in the testing repo, so the ones on build logs were signed, that would make it easier to consume them for testing. Because we could have, uh, we wouldn't need to fiddle with turning off GPG check, we could ship config worship for them in mock CentOS configs. It would generally make testing easier. With that said, I don't think they should be signed with the same key we use for production. I think that would be a terrible idea. So if we if we go down this path, I think what we probably want to do is to have a separate key, call it CentOS testing, kind of like Fedora has for testing stuff. Um, and sign the packages on build logs with that. Neil, you're muted. You, you're trying to say something, but you're muted. Hardware mute. Forgot about that. Anyway, we don't use a separate key for testing in Fedora. We don't? No. No, 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 no. Separate key makes everybody's lives miserable. That's why we All don't right. do that. Yeah. yeah my concern I, mean, I don't have a strong feelings on this either way, but my, the it, main it, reason it why we don't. It's reasonable to me to use different keys, but we can do whatever. The main reason why we don't in Fedora, and I think it also applies for us in CentOS, we decide to sign testing content, is that that way it doesn't have to be resigned every time it migrates to a different tag. That's a very expensive and a very annoying operation to do multiple times for no, no appreciable benefit. Um, well, and we don't do tag, tag migrations for uh, CBS content, though, do we? Yeah, we do. If you we, tag something into testing and then you're, you're gravy with it, then you tag Oh, it you're totally it. right. Yeah. yeah, 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 you're right, you're right. Yeah, no, okay, yeah. then we definitely need the same key. That makes sense yeah. then. You don't, yeah. don't want to have Koji have to figure out how to deal with yeah, yeah, yeah. being tagged differently. Yeah, well, and on top of that, if you're doing a system audit and you go, all right, well, this machine has, you know, systemd Facebook 12, and this one has systemd Facebook 12, and they have different signatures. Well, what happened? Yeah, yeah, that's not fun. yeah that that would be that would be bad. Yeah, that, um, that's that's the kind of thing that makes you terribly unsleepy. Um, yeah, no, that's fair. Yeah. Are there any from an infra standpoint? Are there any concerns on signing contents on build logs? I actually uh, think it's okay I've got plenty to put them on the mirror network. Um, well, at least I've I've got some I've got some operational concerns that I might have to think through just based on the way that our signing works. Uh, but um, yeah, this is definitely something that we should scope through the InfraSig uh, and see what we want to do here. All right, so are we in agreement on this, that it's a possibility provided Infra signs off on it? And in which case we can put that comment in so that the ticket can be opened with Infra, which we have not done yet. Yeah, I would say the action here for the board is to decide whether we're okay with these and then implementation specifics would be up to infra. Yeah, I, I would love to have everything signed all of the time. Um, I'm deeply sad by the lack of GPG signatures inside of container files. Um, <laughs> Don't, oh. that's, that's a different conversation, Pat. <laughs> yeah, but if we can sign it, I want to sign it. Um, it, well, we are figuring out how to sign images because that's a requirement that hyperscale folks have. So that's that's something that's coming. Yeah. Somehow. But I yeah, don't know. <laughs> yeah, there is nothing on this earth that I would avoid signing. If we have a trusted source for it, it should be signed. Is there any board member here who is against this moving forward to the infra group? Okay, let's put that comment in that ticket and let them go ahead and open the ticket with infra and we'll move that forward. So the next thing we had was the wiki migration, which started kind of at the face to face in Boston. Um, it was taken to the mailing lists and we discussed it during the doc days in Brussels. And then um, Fabian opened a bunch of email discussions on the mailing list. Um, so I did want to bring up the wiki because I think Davida, you've frozen it and took it, taken a snapshot on it. I know because we were getting hit yes. by bus that logins have been turned off for a little while on the wiki. So, so what like Fabian, opportunity to move forward. What Fabian and I did was that Fabian made a mirror of the existing wiki on a separate machine. I used a scraper 
to get all the content there into static HTML, throw it up here for testing. Uh, and that's what you can see is there now. Now, if we want to productionize this, um, this snapshot is a bit older now and there's been further changes in the wiki. So if we decide we want to move forward and productionize this, what I think we should do is disable edits on the production wiki, mirror it again on the test system, and then I can do another snapshot, update this, and then we can, and obviously this shouldn't leave on GitLab, it should be moved to some like infra control system. Uh, right now it's just there. Uh, for what is worth, the sources for that are, let me find them one sec. Here we go. Yeah, I will say it was fun to watch it crawl. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, yeah, this isn't anything particularly fancy. It's using some like industry standard archival format that makes a giant like blob with all of the data. And then it uses some HTML5 JavaScript thing to present it to the user in a way that isn't terrible. Um, it is a little bit confusing because it spiders also the um, all the pages with active content. So things like, oh, the search appears to be returning search results, but it totally isn't, it's just a static page. So that's why I added a giant red banner on top to make it clear that's not a live wiki. But I mean, I think for archival, this is an okay compromise. And then we should work to move the content that in there that we actually care about to a better location. And we could also, after the fact, got a couple of things like the search bar, the login links, a couple of things like that. Um, yeah, so if someone, if someone is good with HTML, JavaScript, CSS stuff, there's probably avenues to do that. Uh, my knowledge of that is stuck to like about 1999, so I haven't tried. <laughs> but it's something we could ask for an interested contributor to stand up to yep. help us. Yeah, definitely. And the, the data for what is worth seems to be in a format that is pretty easy to extract and do stuff with it if someone wanted to do like nice stuff with it. Uh, I just went for like the lowest possible like effort to do something that was usable. All right, so it's really seeming like we're good to go forward with this. We're still looking for the technology, I believe, that we want to move to. Am I incorrect um, in that? So I mean, the archive itself, we can just throw it. We can either leave it on GitLab or we can throw it on a machine in, uh, on Sandos Infra, and that's easy because it's just a static website. Right. Uh, we we did have a discussion at the docs hack of what what we want to use for like actual documentation um if i remember right sean you posted a recap of that uh so i don't I want did, to speak I posted for you to, i posted to CentOS promo and uh, i think there's some stuff that's yet undecided one of the things on my uh to-do list is to go through uh now that i i just have a page list because of your wiki archive is to just go through and just effectively spreadsheet it of like what this is what bucket it falls into and what to do and some of the content can just be archived permanently it doesn't need to live somewhere some of the content should just be some sort of page on www it doesn't need to be on a wiki um some of the content is docs content and we need to uh, uh we've had talks about how to enable various types of docs content um and it sounds like people are happy with the make docs um Thing that we have for SIG, so trying to set that up for uh, writing um, CentOS-specific stuff, the quick guides, contributors guides, whatever, all that kind of stuff, uh, doing with the make docs uh, type thing like we use for SIGs. Uh, event stuff, David had suggested making basically an event site that's effectively kind of a static archival of, of things. Um, so anyway, I, I cover, I think I covered all that stuff in the my recap to the promo list, but there's definitely I think we have a, a sense of what we want to do. It's not necessarily a solid plan on how to do it, but a sense of what we want to do with uh, the majority of the content that is on the wiki. Yeah, the other thing I would say here, one thing we discussed that I think is really important is in whatever format we decide this content goes, is preserving a way for contributors to do translation and internationalization work, because that was a big part of what people did with the wiki. Uh, so from MKDocs, um, we, we discussed that there's a few technical options for that. There's a few plugins for MKDocs we could use for it. So I think it is technically doable. Uh, it's just something we have to keep in mind of. Um, and then like write documentation so that folks that want to do this work can do it. Okay, this is not my slide, sorry. <laughs> All right. So it sounds like we're still working on this. We need to come up with some technologies, work with 
but it sounds like we're almost ready to give it over to Fabian and the infra team to work on something that we have enough of the background documented and what our goals are here. Am I wrong in that assumption? I think that's right. I would say unless there's things that people feel really strongly should be edited in the wiki now before it's archived forever, it's probably as good time as any to freeze it and do it. Yeah, especially being that new logins are disabled. Um, does anyone from the board want to take this as an action item to start the conversations with Infra? I can do that because I was already talking Fabian anyway and did the POC, so I'm happy to take it. Okay. Um, um, it would probably not happen this week. Yes. Scale. Okay. Yeah, enjoy scale. Um, I'll leave it to you to open the tracking ticket on it in the board. Um, just so we know what's going on there. Sounds good. All right. Is there anything else on the wiki we want to discuss? Okay. Um, next is issues. We have stopped listing all the issues just to bring up some to discuss. Um, and I had pulled out the ones that I thought we had movement on, which was 92. So I think that's the only one we had movement on. Um, a lot of them, Sean, were yours about the SIGs. Um, and if there's no one who wants to discuss any of the issues, we can move to your update. Uh, I'd like to hit 93 briefly. 93? All right, let me bring uh, that is the uh, writing up an announcement to discuss the uh, end of seven and eight. Mm -hmm. I dumped a link in uh, Matrix. It's not like a secret, so you can share it with people who want to help write it nicely. Um, uh, soliciting feedback for some stuff to put in there and make sure it all looks nice and pretty. Uh, worked with the uh, Red Hat folks to do, oh, they're going to try and put up a blog on how to convert uh, CentOS Linux 7 to RHEL 7 if you want to purchase EUS support because you just can't move this product yet. And they're going to put something together on that, I think. Uh, Sean's looking puzzled and he was there, so perhaps I misunderstood. No. I'm sorry. I was I was reading the chat and uh, and and uh, my my brain was going elsewhere. No, no, everything you said is correct. Okay, it's like I thought I understood what was going on, and then it's like yes. a puzzle. Maybe not. I might not know. No, and then I I was going to uh, uh, work on the website, which I've done some work on. Uh, I have a hard time getting Jekyll to run. So, uh, but trying to get banners in the right places to point to. So what what Pat has written here would go up on the blog. And hopefully with links to other stuff that uh, we get on Red Hat blog, as Pat was saying. Um, and then various banners were like on the front page and the download pages and stuff. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to uh, get those added in. All right. And I'm putting the notes for this in while Pat's been talking. So hang on. And I dropped a link to the draft announcement in the chat for those of you who feel like reading it and playing with it. Yep. And it's now in the agenda. It, this isn't really a new issue, but that seemed like the best place to put it um, in the agenda. So the link to the issue um, and the HackMD file that we've been writing the draft on it is now on the agenda. Yeah, that was all I have. Okie doke. All right, so now we are moving on to you, Sean. Um, so I, uh, I, I'm like still catching up with like post Fosdom and CentOS Connect stuff. I have like mailings to go out, so that's fun. Um, oh, scale is this weekend. Uh, I'll be there. We'll have a booth. Uh, turns out Carl will be there, so he's going to help with the booth. But if anybody else is there and you want to um, do some booth time, that's cool. Um, and if you want a shirt, I'll bring some of these shirts, but there's not a whole lot. So like if you if you really want one, tell me a size and I'll hold it for you. Um, I, I do, I think we need some discussions around events going forward. Um, I, I sent an email to the board about, about uh, doing virtual events, or purely virtual events and what those could look like, um, whether to rebrand them, uh, trying to make the format a little bit better for uh, 
basically not trying to recreate an in-person event, but trying to, to tailor the, the format of them to what really works well for a virtual event. Um, so um, anyway, no, it'd be good to get those going if we want to have them uh, and to have a plan around them. So, um, and then for in-person events, um, for uh, we'll, we'll do, I mean, we've already agreed to do another CentOS Connect at um, DevConf US, which gets us the US East Coast. We are sorely lacking in the US uh, West Coast representation on this. Um, and we've had some conversations there, but um, uh, like I've thought about scale, but it's just so close to, to FOSDEM. Um, and uh, Conservancy starting up this new FOSSE thing that's gonna happen in Portland. Um, but I, uh, I think I'll attend to that and see how it looks this year. So I don't know. Um, uh, I think that's everything around events, unless people wanna talk about any of those things around events. That's, I would like to keep doing some kind of virtual stuff. Yeah. Um, in part because travel is tricky and in part because I know we have some community members who are more mobility challenged. And so this gives them a place for them to come and interact with us without having to worry about some of the more complex travel things. Right. Yeah, and I did really like the idea of calling them something different. I like the name of the sync, um, which was our number two name when we came up with connect so i think that gives them their own identity which is good which also doesn't give us the pressure of trying to imitate connect remotely um and even if we just do four hours you know versus a full day yeah it's really hard to commit to a whole day for like when you don't go somewhere you know so yeah. well it also helps with times and like if you do mornings you know you, you catch Europe in the middle of their day, the U.S. early in their day, and late in the day for APAC. Yeah, it, I mean, if, if these are on a regular cadence, maybe even maybe quarterly, like we might consider uh, kind of alternating uh, when they are. If, if there's some time zones that we're just not capturing well, um, I do think for the majority of our attendance, uh, our attendees are basically between U.S. West Coast and and Europe. Um, uh, so, like my afternoon as an as a U.S. East Coast, um, like kind of captures that well. But the, you know, I'm I'm cognizant of the uh, there's the the lesson about the the planes and where they were shot and whatever. And like this is where we should re anyway. I'll mess it up if I talk about it, but I. The majority of our attendees might be in those time zones because we keep doing events that are good for those time zones. Yeah. Um, and so uh, we might consider doing some doing some shifting uh, if we do them regularly enough. Basically. Hmm? It's basically time zone confirmation bias. It yeah. It's because it's always happening there. So, yeah. but insofar as like West Coast events, Linux Fest Northwest is coming back this year in October. Uh, okay. So, uh, and Location? like, hmm? where Bellingham, Washington, Bellingham, Washington, in the same place it's been uh, forever. Forever. Yeah. That's just Linux Fest moves around. So, yeah. But um, the this is basically their attempt to properly revive the event. So they are asking for people who are interested in sponsoring, attending, boothing, whatever to contact them early to register interest so that they can get everything set up in time. Cause they're doing this in the fall rather than the spring. So they don't, they won't have quite as much of the student help type stuff that they've typically gotten in the past. Things so like that. Carl told me about that and I looked at their website and there was, I, I thought very little information on what to do if I'm interested in doing a booth or whatever. So. They, uh, they apparently I, I didn't know they were decided actively. to do it on Sunday. Okay, okay. So, um, like, the only reason I know is I was there on Linux Unplugged on Sunday, and Chris Fisher is, from Jupiter Broadcasting is actually helping revive the event. Uh, and so, like, they're literally just putting it all together, so that's probably why the information's not up okay. there. Um, I'll keep my eye on it. Chris mentioned that you can just email him 
um, for the moment to to get deets on this. So you might want to just shoot an email to Chris Fisher. I'll I'll send you a, a message with his email address a little bit later if you don't already have it, and and you can get in touch with the organizers that way and figure it out. So so that's an opportunity um, that I don't think we've had in a long time. Yes. I don't think we've done anything in the Pacific Northwest. And it might be nice to run something like the day before this to get all the people we wouldn't normally get being that they're all Linux people. Mm -hmm. Could do a connect there. That would be awesome. Save that would, Travis yeah. That'll make Diane happy because it'll be super easy for her, her to come down. <laughs> I was already planning on it, so I already I already put my two cents in. But I, I actually think Fosse is going to to be a viable option as well, uh, as well as um, maybe um, open open in for summit this summer, doing something side by side with that. Um, you probably open for this year. Yeah, this, and it's here in Vancouver, so yeah, I have a bias. I have a West Coast bias, uh, so. Well, I'll definitely be there for that. Um... Yeah, this and hey, I think Sean, we have talked about associate membership at the foundation at Open Infra. So. What, huh? Okay. <clears throat> that may be. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I, I want a U.S. West um, something. So um, I am looking at Fosse, and I'm looking. At, I, I, I can look at. The Northwest Linux Fest. Yeah. And, I mean, I think those so. would be two good options that are stable to do a connect. Um, and if we want to do a meetup at Open Infra, you know. Oh, for sure. Yeah. We can do yeah. meetups around anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that, I mean, because I don't think we want to necessarily put a full, you know, say this is going to be our West Coast connect because next year I think we'll, it, the Infra Summit will be in Asia. So that's not something we want to associate the connect with per se because we want something stable on the west coast but having something smaller or get together there i think it might be a good idea um so thank you for mentioning that diane um but yeah i mean it might be worth looking at fossey or linux fest northwest depending on timing whether either of those are a good location for a west coast connect yeah. so that would give us a west coast connect a east coast connect and continuing with FOSDEM for the in-person European Connect. And then we add two to three virtuals in sporadically. So I think we'd want to do more than one. So. Yeah. I think we could potentially even do more virtual than that. Um, but I think that's a, a good cadence. Um, I think there's a... Mm, I, I like the idea of having three regular U.S. West, U.S. East, and Europe, with the ability to float in a fourth one if the opportunity arises. Um, like a special like, event that's coming up yeah. that you know just seems perfect. Right, or like if CERN says, "Hey, come have a connect this year," and it's like it doesn't have to be a commitment to do it every year, but it's like this year we're doing this cool thing. So yeah, yeah. cool. Okay. Um, so I will keep that all on my radar. Now you did put out the Connect survey, which did. is the time zone question. Maybe mm -hmm. we kind of put that time zone question out individually. Yes. So um, decide on the sinks. I have in my uh, another bullet point. Um, I've had a vague idea about doing some sort of survey, um, some sort of CentOS survey of. Um, there's things that I want to know and track um, people's level of understanding of what CentOS stream is, their sentiment towards CentOS project, their understanding of the SIGs, um, various things like that, but then also some demographic stuff like what is their time zone so we can try to make sure we're having that. Um, it's a very vague idea. I've written down like the scratch notes. Um, so if there's things other people want to know and track, the, the idea of this would be to do it semi-regularly to get longitudinal data um then you know let me know what you would want i'm not sure how to um 
Yeah. I'm trying to think of how I would get the word out about it that would um, not get me a, 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 that would reduce my selection bias, basically, so. Yeah, I know it's hard because if you put it out on social media, you do get res you have the risk, the risk chance of getting responses from people that you weren't targeting on the other side. If we're trying to figure out where or what time zone people who are interested are in, maybe that's not a bad thing. It all depends on the content of the survey, to be honest with you. And Sean, if you're doing a survey, if, if you can incorporate a question or two about um, awareness of the CentOS Stream CoreOS initiative, that would be yeah. really helpful for us um, so that we know how we're tracking there and also to build some awareness that it exists. I'll put that in my notes for it. Thank you. I, I would come to you and Christian to like figure out actual wording. what to actually ask, yeah. And there's also a community meeting every other Tuesday. It moved from Blue Jeans to Zoom, which is why I kept being the only one there because I'm still logging into Zoom. Um, yeah. On the Fedora calendar, um, and it should be updated there, I think. Yeah. yeah. It was right in the email that I get, but it was wrong in my calendar that I had for reminding myself. Um, um, so that might also be a good group to ask what efforts they're doing for the community and documentation and possibly get a good question out of them as well. All right, where are we on time? We are seven minutes to go. We have no other SIG talks, I mean SIG reports, um, but we have any other business open if we want to discuss anything. Um, I have one call out. Right. Uh, Adam, Channel Link, uh, the CentOS stream team, and um, the infra team have actually pulled off merging the eight and nine stream workflows, um, which is actually a pretty big accomplishment, both for uh, the internal Red Hat engineers um, who, who were very gracious and patient, uh, but also for external com uh, community contributions, because now it's the same thing across all the releases. And I know it's perhaps a little late in the tooth for uh, percent of S3 mate, but it still counts and I'm pretty proud of them. So I just wanted to give them some kudos. Yeah, that's a big deal. Uh, you, you changed the workflow across the environment for the enterprise product. Um, yeah. yeah. What's the likelihood you need the same percent? Very high. <laughs> oh, okay, good. Yes, very high. Uh, in fact, that that is um, I'll I'll put my own uh, butt on the line. That is one of my goals is to make sure that we have a common workflow across major versions going forward. So uh, I can't promise it, but it's definitely one of the things we're focused on. Well, even if it's, I mean, I'm going to just say it's better late than never, and still awesome to have it happen. Uh, it means one less koji in the sea of kojis that CentOS is running. So there's at least that, uh, hopefully, maybe. Brian's looking at me like I don't, like, I, and I feel nervous oh, about this answer. No, that's, that, that is a true statement. Uh, so the, the old inbox setup is, um, well, right now it's read only, but it's gonna continue that way for its life cycle. So you can still get old, old packages, but uh, all of the builders are going away and being repurposed uh, probably over the next few weeks. Uh, there's not every single build in the the, the new system. That's uh, we can talk about that sometime. Sure. But um, but yeah, uh, historical purposes you can go to the old one, but it's going to be read only. Okay. Well, still better than nothing. <laughs> uh, like uh, I'm happy to have one endpoint to look at all of them. Still slightly chuffed about it being kojihub.stream.centos.org instead of koji.stream.centos.org, but you know, whatever. Uh, at least it's one endpoint I can go look at all the things again. Uh, so from, from the guy who actually did automation to poke at the bear and look at things all the time, I at least appreciate that they're all there in one place because it is a pain in the butt to shift back and forth all the time.
All righty. Do we have anything else anyone wants to call out or discuss in our last four minutes? All right, then. We will try to get Florian here to discuss the X86 SIG next month. Um, and hopefully we'll have some updates with the wiki. Thank you everyone for coming. And take care. Have a good day. I'm not sure if I log off if it's going to shut everyone else out. So I, I actually forgot to mention out loud, but in case this gets back to Sean when you're reviewing this, feel free to cut off the long diatribes about MQTT and Home Assistant at the beginning of this conversation so I'm that anyone who does. actually chooses to come to this meeting is either not excited and then very disappointed or, or otherwise confused about why the CentOS project wants to talk about Zigbee. So, yeah, because the I, minute we log in, the recording starts. So I'm pretty sure. Right, it was already there, and Pat and I were just talking. Pat's still here. Um, yeah. But uh, I, I was, yeah. I was so talking if I about watch my the beginning toys. Of this recording, I'm going to get an exciting story about Zigbee. And MQTT. Zigbee, MQTT, and a wireless tag that I bought out of China that is an e ink display. Um, nice. I've just been playing with those things. So, so that anyway, goes into that, the outtakes. I, I was going to say, I think it can be cut safely, but anyway, home assistant's doing things, and I'm kind of excited. I feel like a dork again because I haven't touched hardware in a long time. So. All right, anyway. I'm going to hit the end button. You may All still right. be here. You may not. I'm going to go away, so ciao. All right, take care. <laughs>